Madison, thank you so much for doing this. I always ask the guests to do a, a small sort of introduction of who they are and how they got to where they're at. Uh, so if you can just tell people about yourself. I know we had a conversation, it was probably two years ago. So if people haven't listened to that, I encourage them to do so. But otherwise, what's happening and, and tell us about yourself. Yes, of course. Uh, it's great to be back. Um, my name is Addison Brazil. I guess right now, more than anything, I'm the author of my book, First Year of Grief Club, A Gift from a Friend Who Gets It. And I guess in order to understand how a 33-year-old guy writes a book about grief and offers it to other people, <laughs> you have to understand that I navigated through some very complex um grief processes through throughout my 20s. I, I lost my brother to an inoperable brain tumor, just sort of on the cusp of my 20s. Um, and then a few years later, I found my father after his suicide. Um, and then I sort of went out in the world and tried to fix my mental health, which we talked a little bit about last time where I just sort of went out and, and tried to figure out how to fix everything that these deaths, um, you know, losing both my brother and my father before 25, created for me. And, and I think I thought I had done it, to be honest. I, I think I thought I figured it out that I could sort of have this master of vices mixture of modalities thing. And it was like, I'm good. I be grief. And I actually kind of started celebrating that a little bit. And, um, and one night I was out celebrating and, and on the way home, we got into a very, very bad accident and I lost a, a dear friend of mine. And I was left relearning to walk and with a brain injury and hospitalized and basically got, um, another really big reset. Uh, and it came with a total new, you know, scheme of, of, of issues and challenges to navigate because there was this also this physical aspect um, and um, just a totally different grief process. So from those three grief processes, I became sort of this grief guy that people would always come to or call whenever something happened. And the funny part is even having been through all that, whenever somebody would do that, I would just sort of freeze. Cause I it was kind of like a stand is not real thing. I didn't want to tell them what they were really in for, you know, and, and what loss had been like for me. Um, so after 13 years of freezing that turned into more of a soul pull and we get this book where um, I wanted to just offer something that you could give to somebody instead of flowers or casseroles right on day one. Um, if you were to hand me over to a friend or a loved one and I was gonna stay with them every week for a year, what would I really say? And that's sort of where this book came from and um, what, I, what I put out in the world in the last six months, I guess. Yeah, thank you. It, it's... <sighs> You have so many uh, points in the book where you encourage people to do the check-in or the pause. And mm. I guess I'm practicing that right now. Just to hear you describe that, it's, um, yeah, it's moving. It's, so I'm, I'm doing a little check-in, noticing the uh, tingles in my body and, and that stuff and tuning into my breath. I'm, I'm happy to practice what I preach to and, and check in because I this episode's kind of special because I really wasn't sure when when you extended the date to me because we already rescheduled once and then yes, the date came yes. and it's actually the eve of the 10 year anniversary of my father's suicide. Um, mm -hmm. And that is coming with a lot in the book. I say, you know, grief is not something you want or it's not something you fix. It's something you honor. And it's funny when you go into these conversations, you're like, OK, dude, you're really going to be honoring today like you're really like going to be chewing on that that offering and so I just I do want to you know check in and say that I'm really viscerally so much in my grief today and feeling so much and and I'm, I'm happy to be in this safe space but I would you know I wouldn't be being authentic to myself if I didn't admit the exact timing of this conversation and and how much of what I'll probably say today to your questions will be tested by the fact that I'm actually really in you know my grief right now um, and not maybe as spokesperson or advocate Addison as sometimes I can you know kind of jump into so um, thank you for checking in and thank you for reminding me to check in yeah <sighs> It's just nice to sit with those things. Um, Maybe we could just so, do deep breaths for the next hour. Yeah, we don't have to talk yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now I'm trying to get out of it. Now I'm like, oh, God. 
Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so I actually, from what you were just mentioning, as you sort of gave that picture of kind of how you got here, there was a part in the book is jumping ahead in my notes a bit, but where you mentioned when, you know, I might get the um, order wrong, but I think I got it. it was like when your brother died, you went into overachieving when your dad died, you kind of withdrew. And then when your friend passed and you had the car accident, I can't remember what the, how you summarized that, but maybe because you kind of just mentioned it a minute ago. So yeah, can you I just for, expand for on that? Things? Yeah, for, you know, when my brother passed, it was also something we were aware was happening, was going to happen, you know, because he had an inoperable brain tumor and, you know, there's doctors and, you know, palliative care and, and you know, that moment is sort of coming. Um, and I was at the time dancing on scholarship at a school. I had already kind of set my own purpose, which is actually in retrospect, very lucky for me in my grief process that I, I was already aligned so heavily with something I wanted to get back to that I wanted to fight for regardless of you know, how heartbreaking it was and, and sort of in honor of him. And, and my brother's death being, you know, I was 19 and he was 17 and I like was, all my dreams were coming true and coming back from my first year of truly the best year of my life. Cause again, that was the last time my whole family was alive. It was my first year of school. Like, you know, it was just like, it was incredible. And there was some, with my brother being the older brother, there was this in inheritance and pre-inheritance cause I started the, the nonprofit that helped other people with brain tumors before he even passed so that he could be a part of the process. But I inherited this sort of, sort this feeling of like, I want to do everything that he can't do, or I want to do everything I want to do because I get to. And not everyone in my family had that at all. I wanted to, you know, eating things that he liked made parts of my family upset and they withdrew from that. I wanted to eat twice as much. Like that was just my very natural response to, to his passing and the type of person he was. And then obviously with my father's death, very unexpected, um, and very traumatizing. And it came with, with PTSD, you know, it came with this diagnosis and, and, and this, this calibrating of trying to understand emotionally and physically this trauma, but also that it wasn't just this trauma that we needed to resolve, like as if I had seen a stranger, you know, after they died by suicide, but this was my father. This was the attachment I had to the man I thought that would always be there to protect me. Um, and I, and I lovingly felt obviously very unprotected in that moment because, you know, of what I experienced. And so, you know, like I said, I went out in the world and then with the, what happened with the accident, what I often say, it was almost like at that point I was trying to run Windows on Mac. It was just like a full restart, like the system, it, it, the operating system had to be updated, recoded. Like I just, I could not function or live in a world where these things were possible. And yet I needed to and had to, if I wasn't going to fall into the male suicide statistic as a result of what I had been through. And as you know, from our last conversation, I was very aware from my father's death on about the entire men's mental health movement and what the statistics were against me and what the statistics are even are of somebody who witnesses what I had witnessed. So, so I inherited from my dad more of this need of a mental health education. And so it started with a withdrawal it started with dealing with the trauma and then it, deal, it, it turned into this real responsibility to you know, kind of sort myself out and, and figure out how I was gonna, how I was gonna move forward and what, what true resilience looked like because a lot of what was being offered to me was like getting by and I was 24 and I was like, what if I live till I'm a hundred? Like, I don't want to get by, you know, like this is obviously so unexpected that I'd be in this position, but you know, I, I still want to thrive. And as much as that was tangled in a grief process with grief and guilt as well, that I got to have those feelings and got to do all that, it was still absolutely necessary to me um, to sort of figure that out, what that looked like, you know? Yeah. And yeah, I guess, how did you do that? What were sort of... You know, it was, it was a lot of fixing and it's, it's really, it's much easier to speak about it now because I also understand 
through all my own research, what was actually happening. But in that moment, especially, you know, when it was 14 years ago or 10 years ago with my father, or even now four years ago or five years ago since the accident, you know, it, it was a lot more of wandering around in the dark. I didn't really understand what was happening. And, and I just sort of, it was kind of like, I use this analogy a lot, but, you know, someone can put a nail on the table and say the nail needs to go in the wall. And there's just sort of this room around you of things and you don't know what a hammer is. You don't know that that's what its job is. There's so many ways to get a nail in a wall. And, you know, I started by using my own palm and, and like it made, you know, marks on me and hurt me <laughs> to do it, but I got it done, you know? And then maybe I went to like a shoe, it works, but you know, it's like leaving a print on the wall and it's cracking. And like, so it's like, you get how the metaphor goes to eventually where you pick up this thing, which we know as a hammer that has like a grip for my hand specifically and is meant to perfectly put a nail in a wall without creating any damage. And so that's sort of what that process was like for me. And, and what that process was like with me is every time I tried to fix it, every time I tried to get rid of it, every time I tried mm. to exit grief club, um, I, I had a really hard mental health lesson that would follow very quickly because that just wasn't possible. And so it became this idea and sort of the basis of this book of, you know, not learning to live without someone or something, but learning who you are now within that loss. And so it's a series of experiments of getting to know yourself and not trying to fix anything, but honoring what comes up. And it's like, okay, what do you mean? Like honor what comes up? But just like we did at the start of this call, today was very different and has been very different because what today is for me. Today, 10 years ago, there were things I still could have done. And I'm gonna try not to get emotional, but that is the reality of my today. When I think about July 20th, every year, all the days leading up to July 21st, I know where I was and I know that there was things that could have been done to maybe change this horrible thing. And then on July 21st, even though it seems like it's the big bad day, there's usually a release. There's a, and we're past the point where something could have been done. And that's sort of the way my, my mind goes. So, you know, honoring the journey is in, in each of those days and every day before or after, I'm waking up every morning and checking in with myself and actually based on how I'm feeling and how I'm doing, making decisions and adjusting my day and using my own tools from, from those experiments I've done over time based on what's coming up, you know? So it's not gonna be a one thing, like you might have headache and this certain medicine that you go to, you know, this is like the most complex headache of all time and different things are going to help it. So it's this thing where I go, okay, so, you know, there's a lot of anxiousness here. There's, you know, this, the, this tendency that I, I want to ruminate. I know I want to ruminate today. And so all day today, I've been pulling out my, we're only in this moment presence tool. And that might look totally different to somebody else. But for me, I know exactly what this is. And I, and I just gently keep saying to myself, that's not the moment we're in, buddy. Right now, you can smell the grass. Right now, it's raining in London. Right now, you know, it's like, what? And I it just, it's just going, where are we in this moment? Where are we in this moment? And, but I, that didn't work yesterday. That's not what yesterday was for, right? So it's this idea of honoring where you're actually at. And it's very difficult to get a point where you're willing to do that because it, it can feel very conflicting to deal with where you're actually at. And it can feel like failure. It felt like failure for me when I would feel this way again, six years later, seven years later, 10 years later, normally before I came to these conclusions, it really would have felt like failure that I'm still feeling this way, but it's not, it's, you know, it's, it's honoring exactly what would come up and, and logically, I mean, yeah, that was my dad and the terrible thing happened. And, you know, so what's going on right now and, and how can I kind of tend to that? So, um, you know, I, I say like, I can't give you a toolkit and I, I can't give you 10 things and tell you where the hammer is and what the screwdriver is when it comes to grief. What I can offer you is spending a year with me and you experiment where you start to identify what your hammer looks like and what your screwdriver looks like and you know where to get them. And also always having the willingness that the second that doesn't work anymore, that there's an upgrade, there's a change, you don't use that tool anymore, whatever, there's, there's no finality. And it's like, I know I sound like a broken record, but I have to tell myself this 10 times a day, every day, there's no fix, buddy. So what's coming up? 
there's no, yeah, I get it. You want it to be over, you know? And it's just, it's naturally like our brains are wired for stories to end, for patterns to complete, for things to be resolved. And this isn't a resolve, you know, grief club starts today. It starts and it ends never. And I didn't want to be the guy that said that originally. And that's why I stayed quiet for 14 years. But now I realize that that can be very, very uplifting in a not in a I'm going to put rainbows on your sadness way, but just in if you get into the realness of what's really going on, there's a lot more opportunity within that to live your life, your real life, mm-hmm. where that person really passed or you really lost that job or whatever it is. I'm not offering you an alternate. I'm saying to live your real life, which fully acknowledges. And I never assume that I know, even with all my grief, that I know anything about anybody else's. It's just scientifically based on their bond and what they've lost. <laughs>